Okay, listen up, people. It's Tasha D here, two-time Olympian and Olympic bronze medalist, and you are watching, listening to another episode of Global Sports Channel Sports Personality Spotlight. Now, those of you who are watching may see a little shimmer, a little glisten, a little messed up eye makeup on my face because before the show, Montel had me dying laughing for like five, 10 minutes. It was just completely nuts, but that's her personality. Montel Douglas is an elite athlete. I'm not going to say a sport because she just does everything. But listen, if I was her manager and she was working shows in Vegas, I'd call her charisma because she has it all. Everybody give a round of applause. I don't care if we can hear you or see you for the one and only Montel Douglas. Montel, how you doing? What are you doing over there? There you go. <laughs> how you doing, hey, Montel? <laughs> I'm oh good. I'm God. good. Thank you. I'm better now. And I'm better now. We had oh a little incident. You had me crying, oh, yeah. crying before the show. You're just <laughs> where does this personality come from, Montel? You're just so full of life. I don't know. Do you know what? I am a huge I'm a huge advocate of people being themselves. And I think when you when you look at people like, oh my gosh, you do this, 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 and I'm just, I'm real, you know, girl, we're, the, we're yeah. exactly the same, we're real, and we are who we are, and we don't make any apologies for it, we don't try and hide it in any way, and I've always been quite bubbly. I'm a little bit eccentric, that's why I think, but I think you would agree with me as well, that's probably why it comes a little bit crazy, but I accept it, so then, you know, it's great that you love that. Right, exactly. Crazy is my favorite. So, you know, there's fun, there's crazy. Crazy is my absolute favorite. So that's why we've always got along. Now, for those that are not good with accents, where are you from, Montel? Well, I am I'm from the really deep south of Catford. <laughs> <laughs> so guys, yeah, I'm a South Londoner, born, bred, proud. I've lived everywhere in London. So I've I actually was told by one of my good friends the other day, who's a South Londoner also. You're not really, you can't be still claiming South. You ain't been there for years. But I'm like, <gasps> I don't think you lose. Do you know what? Exactly. exactly. I was like, you serious? You don't lose that. Like, I'm, I was raised in Slusham, Catford, the, the the dirty South, as we like to call it. Um, So, I, yeah, I'm from London and I have always lived here, apart from a, a mini stint about six months in the beautiful of LA. So, I'm very familiar with being out there. And I think if things had been different, maybe, then I would have definitely gone to America would have been the next place for me to live but I'm but I'm happy where I am and yeah I mean enjoy life enjoy life here. absolutely and I'm I'm from Sydney so you know as the Americans say soft side like I'm, I'm, <laughs> too. Like, I'm, I'm still claiming it yeah. I ain't I've been I've been living in LA for gosh I mean since I was 18 which could have been like two years ago but um yeah the math is a little off but you know yeah we always claim it now you you grew up in London and have spent most of your life in London. But, you know, when I was researching, I'm like, who the heck is Montel? Like, I know Montel the athlete, Montel the crazy personality, Montel the grown woman. But who's Montel? Like, what was your upbringing like? I know you have a brother, but I was like, I realised I don't know about your actual history. You know, what was your school days like? What was your parents like? All that kind of good stuff. Tell me a little bit more about you and your background. Well, I hate when people say that, oh, they're from, you know, humble beginnings. I guess that's what it was for me. Um, so my upbringing, like you, South, like South London, born in Lisham Hospital. And I, I was actually born, my parents were really young. And I think it's an important part of my journey and who I am, that they were 19 and 20 when they had me. Right. So we've always been close because we're very close in age. You don't realise. But, you know, when you're a kid, you look at your parents as like they're always adults. But when I look back at it and I was really close to my mum, like she was not even 30 when, when I was in primary school. And the kind of kind of personality that she has, I, I definitely am my, my mother's child. Like she's crazy, she's wild, she's out there. She does what she wants, how she wants, when she wants. And, but I look back and I was like, because she was young, they were, they were very young, they worked their butts off, they worked hard. Um, so I was raised, like you said, in, in Catford. We moved to, yeah, we moved to Catford from Lee Green, from like a really small place in Lee Green. Uh, when I was 10 years old and I was just pretty much there my whole my whole teen years and that we I remember my dad and my mum working like my mum was a PA my dad was the delivery driver for initial so he's come and pick me up in like a big delivery van I used to love it like really had to climb onto the steps and I was coming to pick me up from school and I, I really just I really just knew about like working to be honest I, I had my aspirations I was very academic like when I was in, in school, I was always reading. I was always kind of like top sets kind of thing. I was always very academic. 
but of course as an athlete I loved sport um I started off sport from day dot from and I had all boy cousins I'm the oldest of about 30 well the second oldest of about 30 grandchildren wow. and we were pretty much raised by our grandparents and my nan because my mum dad worked and they were they were young so they they worked from early and then I'd go to my nan's house and holidays and stuff like that so I had all these boy cousins for a very long time so I'd play football I'd be climbing trees be playing 40, 40 home knock down ginger just just winging out on the streets of South London to be honest and and we had fun doing that and I think you know you hone your skills naturally doing those things and I always I always played out so my love of sport as an athlete definitely started from then and like you said I've got a younger brother I say younger brother he's seven years younger than me and actually how he came about which is I don't know if he actually came about that. My mum actually messed, um, spoke to me when I was like at seven and she said to me, for your birthday, do you want a brother or do you want a bike? So I said, a brother. And then there he was. So I'm pretty sure she was really pregnant at the time, now that I'm older, because I was like, wow, she really, she really did that. She, she really gave me one word. Yeah, she did. I didn't know what she would have done if I asked for a bike, because that would have been on her, mate. I'm all right. I'll give you that just in case. Um, yeah, I've got a younger brother, so who's super into football. Um, but yeah, he was my only sibling. So for a long time, actually, I wasn't. I felt like I was an only child, and I used to talk to myself, play games, do stuff a lot on my own, which is kind of how I probably you know started the crazy journey of being me. To be honest, right, right. So, do you think that you know the hard work that you saw your parents do and the kind of family atmosphere? was something that helped you or something that you channeled into sports, track and field, the team atmosphere, the hard work that you had to do? Do you think the way that that whole family setup was affected how you approached the sport? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And and not only that, because you are who you are, like you, do you know what I mean? You, you come into this world, actually, you're a whole human being already. So the way your personality kind of comes out it can be crazy. So as a youngster, I was kind of like really literal. I was kind of figuring out the world. I love obviously meeting people, meeting friends, but I was my, my kind of like the economy of my family and how we've been raised everywhere. No one went to university, no one went to college. They, you know, 16 and you go to work. But I was always taught by my mum, like my mum always said to me, look, you want to do, you can do a job, you need to do it properly, always. I mean, she was saying this when I was hoovering the house. So uh, I'm sure she was just trying to get me to make sure that I didn't leave any crumbs everywhere. But it did the job, you know, it yeah. actually did the job. And I, and I really did see that. And I really took that on board. I was like, oh my gosh, because when I was, when I was born, like a lot of the time people say your first word is mum or dad. My, my first word, you know, baby money, <laughs> my first word was good, okay? Wow. And it was good because my mum, whenever I did anything, whether it was I ate all my food, because I was a little chubby chubby, I love eating food, whether it was, I was doing, she was obviously trying to get me to play with something and I was doing it, she'd always say, good girl, good girl, good girl. So my first word wasn't mum, wasn't dad, it was good, because I heard it so often. And I think that says it all in terms of when I was, as a baby, I got that feedback from my mum telling me that if I do this well, I'm getting kind of that, that reward, that praise from her and from my family, that I would want to do more good stuff. So I just always wanted to do my best. So everything I did from then on, I was just going 100. I'd go 100 at everything. I'm like, I'm going to hoover this room the best this has ever been hoovered. I'm going to go hard at it. And it's like, it just took me to every every aspect of my career then on because it really taught me how to if I was going to do something I would kind of fulfill it and, and max it out and that's why it's got to where I got to just like today right that raises a great question because there's always this argument and I saw something online the other day where I think it was a coach had told an athlete and I don't know what the history was but he basically told him he's worthless his parents shouldn't have ever had him right so trying to use negative uh, feedback to kind of push the athlete and reinforce. Now, given that you were raised that way, you were able to achieve so much on positive reinforcement. What are your feelings about negative versus? I mean, even Dr. Phil says it takes a thousand. It takes a thousand attaboys just to negate the one negative comment that you gave to someone. What's your thoughts on on that? Um, and have you seen coaches trying to? use the negative side to encourage someone and, and does it work and if it does work how long wh where do you stand with that 
I think it definitely boils down to the, the person that's been receiving the information. I, I don't necessarily, I would never count out any kind of, of technique. I wouldn't say one is better than the other because we are all different human beings. And what is good, what's good for the goose is not always good for the gander as far as saying right. Jamaican saying. Like I personally, something that's negative to me, being someone who's, I actually am quite critical, believe it or funny enough, that you say that. So it might seem that it's negative reinforcements, but I would never put someone down to try and inspire or invoke some kind of emotion. That being said, I do think there's people out there that really fuel off that. They really fuel off the, the naysayers, the people that say you can't do something, you won't do something, you won't. And there is that element where I have been told in my career, I remember, you know, in, in after in about 2010 when I had a really bad injury and they saying to me, you're not going to run over fast again. You can't do this. You can't walk for three months. Like, then very negative comments, but it wasn't in a way to try and get me to be better. I just reversed what was being said to say, well, you're saying that I can't do all this stuff, but how about I focus on all the stuff that I can do? And, and use that energy that you've kind of displayed on me to make it better. So I, I do think that you have to be really careful if you are going to use negative reinforcement as a coach, for example, on an athlete, because not everyone will respond the way that you expect them to. And it's your job really as a coach to get the best out of your athlete, regardless of how you think it needs to be done. If you're saying red, 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 and all they can hear is blue, 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 you need to start saying green because maybe they're going to get red when they come out of it. But that's your job as a coach. You can't keep doing it the way that you feel you're doing it when you're not getting the result that you want and they're not getting the result that they want. So I think having the the, the mindset of what am I trying to do with this person? How What am I trying to invoke? Is it working? Am I hitting home? But also knowing that you know emotions are emotions. Love is the same as hate, as, it, as indifference. They're all emotions. And if we can use them in the right way and sugar them in the right way, you will get the result that you, that you want. Absolutely. I think that is the art of coaching is being able to identify who's in front of you and what they need and what you need to do to make them their best. And it's not the same for everyone because just like fingerprints, everybody's different. Now, you said you're critical. Are you critical or do you have high standards? Oh, I like that. I never thought I'm, I'm taking that. I am taking it, stealing it, remixing it. From us. I'm going to be putting Monty 2021 on that little reference there. Do not cut at me, Tash, on Instagram. I'm telling you now that I'm stealing it. <laughs> um, the best dude, the best still, I'm not remaking anything. I, I, I absolutely love what you said there because I, I feel other people will really perceive me as being critical because I, I do love to challenge I challenge and you're right it, I never thought of it like that it is because I have very high standards and very high expectations because I would want them for myself I do not want to be in a position where I am falling short and you're looking at me and letting me do it like don't let me walk out into the road and you can see a car coming just tell me there's a car coming so I can be better. But some people are just like me. I'm going to let you hit. And then you're going to learn next time when you get two, two lips and you flip over to the car. But I could have just been like, oh, wait, stop. Come back a bit and give you the chance. And I just treat people how I would want to be treated. But not everyone can take that. And I know it because I would always challenge you if you have an opinion for you to give yourself almost like a chance to prove yourself. Like I'd be like the other day, <laughs> the other day I was talking to someone and I'm like, OK, you've got the burden of proof now. You don't dis you disagree with me. I want you to prove to me then why I'm wrong. And it's not because I just think I'm right. I just want to get your perspective. So you need to explain to me really clearly because you, you should be able to do that. You should be able to, if you're, say, for example, an expert in your field, if you are a coach because we're in the world of training and you think X and I'm saying, well, why would not you do it? Why? I should be allowed to challenge you and your opinion and what you think. And you should be able to show why you think that way without getting your back up, without you thinking that's because if you say you're an expert or you say you want to be better, the only way you can do that really is if you check yourself, like really wholeheartedly check yourself. And if I'm about to say to you, you're not really, you're not really cutting it or this is not really work. At the end of the day, results are results. One coach said to me before, if you told me you wanted to run 12 seconds right now, he said, we would not be having this conversation. But you're telling me you want to run 11 0. So you are going to have to come at me with the same energy that an 11 0 athlete is going to bring. So I cannot be angry when I'm not, when I'm not fulfilling the, the goals that I'm setting myself. Right. Absolutely. I agree with that because at the end of the day, when you look at even the coaching relationship, some athletes do not, do, do not question the workouts, the things that they're being given because it's almost like this 
don't question God type of, <laughs> type of vibe, right? And the problem is, you know, it's not, it's not, there's nothing wrong with questioning your coach, right? As long as it's done in a respectful way. Because at the end of the day, the whole point in you being in the industry is that you grow, but you also need to learn. You need to understand why you're doing what you're doing, you know? And obviously there are some coaches who don't have the answer because they have no idea why they're doing it other than they saw it on the internet or the, their coach used to do it, but they don't know why, but it's important. And I don't, I think you're right. I don't think enough people have that attitude of asking questions and so they end up following and when they end up somewhere that they didn't want to be they don't have any reason for it other than well he should and that's not the life you want to live so (laughs) so I absolutely agree with that but how did you even get into track like how did you even get involved in track and field so I didn't get involved in track and field track and field got involved with me let's put it there like that, that she just picked me up and spat me out. No, I, I really do. I think track found me. I didn't find track when I was um, in secondary school. I went to first secondary school in Bromley in Kent, and we just don't, did athletics at school. So we did, you know, summer term. You do in the UK, you do athletics as a summer sport. So about springtime, you start doing stuff. So I started was in a small hill, started doing high jump. My teacher just said, pick pick a side, run up to the bar, jump over it. And so I did that, you know, I picked the side, did seven steps, jumped over the bar and I broke my year seven record, my year eight record, my year nine record, which is like the first three years of secondary school because I had a natural gift to be able to jump high. Now, I'm very tall, I think, as, as one of the sprinters as well in the world, I'm like five foot ten. And when I was 11, I was probably about five foot eight by this point anyway. I hadn't grown much since then, but I was very tall at 11. So I think naturally my build and my list see, I'm very elastic athlete being able to just jump and have a high center of math. I was very good at high jump and I continued to start doing athletics and high jump and I made it to county standard and I'm at regional standard and then I went to national standard without any training whatsoever. And that's how I kind of got into athletics, but I didn't pick up my event, the 100 meters, a bit later. And it was only because I had a really bad injury. I had a disc um, tear injury when I was about 14 years old like quite quickly because I was having really bad technique I wasn't getting coaching and eventually my back was just giving out I was getting hamstring tears left right center and they basically said you can't jump anymore like you are done jumping and I tested this theory about a year and a half two years later when I was back running and I was getting back into training and I went oh I'll do high jump competition I, I could probably do one right now so you know I ran up to the bar went to jump over it landed back on the ground couldn't get back up like I had to get stretched off now this was in the warm-up I didn't even get to put a little a little jump down for the team wow. because I didn't even make it over the bar. And I really remember lying there on the ground and going, wow, they were really right. I could not <laughs> jump anymore because the doctor said, if you keep jumping, you ain't going to walk. So I was like, well, I don't want to do that. I'm a teenager. Let's not go there. So I kind of was not forced, but highly encouraged by fate to do something else. And my coach who kind of scouted me at, 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 at county championships, he said to me, I was last in competition. I won the competition. He said, are you at a club? And I was like, no. Um, do you train? No. And he said, well, come down to the club, which was actually on the same street of my secondary school. Um, but I never had ambitions of like being a professional athlete because I didn't really see professional athletes. Like, the only person I really knew was Linford Christie because my dad looks just like him. And everywhere we go, everyone would be like, all the time, like all the time, it, they look very similar. And that's the only thing I really knew about track and field. And so it kind of found me because when I realized my talent and I was doing the sport, I kind of just loved it and just kept on progressing from then and took every opportunity that came my way to do as much of it as I could. So when did it go from, yeah, this is not really a thing you can do professionally to, okay, Linford Christie is more than just my dad's lookalike. Like, when did it come to like, okay, I actually want to do this professionally and how did you go about that process so for me my thought process towards professionalism within athletics was very late ash but very late that's like honestly actually to be honest with you after our olympic games in 2008 <laughs> no what a great no, time had been, my <laughs> That was the time I came back from Olympics, went on holiday with the girls, came back from holiday, and that was only the first time that I actually thought, I'm gonna be a professional athlete. <laughs> no joke. Like I never had in my mind that I was gonna do this. I always just, 
it goes back to what my mum was teaching me from a very young age. She was saying, we can do something deep properly. So I always did my best in everything. I, I still try, I do that now. I still do my best. And that's why I'm quite content with the results because I realised from super young age, like my first ever race in athletics, like when I was really young at sports day at school was against like all the boys because my teacher wouldn't let me race with the girls because she told my dad that I beat all the girls every year from when I was little. So it wasn't fair for me to be with the girls. So I had to go with the boys. And she said to me, I'll give you five pounds if you if you beat the boys. And now this is not in 1996 or something, but five pounds, inflation has taken, robbed it from us guys. But five pounds was a lot of money then, a lot of money. And I was buying all the sweets and all this stuff that I could buy with that five pounds. And I did this race and I, I remember going off hard, being in front for so long, looking around, no one's there. Get three calls down, looking around, kind of hear footsteps. And right at the finish line, like I'm dipping. And... I suddenly see one boy there that beat me and I came second in that race. But I was so elated because I did my absolute best. I was like, I've done my best, I'm happy. And I took that through to being an athlete. So I never realized that I was really good. I really didn't for a very long time. And even when I made the Olympic games in track in 2008, I made sacrifices that year that would stop me almost being for the games. For example, everyone went to LA for warm weather training in April. I turned it down. I told my coach, Ayo, God bless his soul. I said, look, I can't focus on my dissertation at uni and going to LA. Like I'm not getting any work done. And I really, those four weeks without him leading up to Olympic games, to me, my grad, like me graduating was a priority. I, it really was something that was bigger than me because you know I was going to be the first person in my family lineage to get a degree ever like no one ever got one and to do that and then qualify for olympic games that it was almost like a side burner so i never really said i'm going to go for it until i was able to because i worked actually as a waitress from 16 to 22 i only quit that job when i made the olympic team and then i was now sponsored by nike and was a full-time athlete so i never had them i still had the working class mindset of i'm going to be a physiotherapist or i'm going to be a psychologist i never had that yeah, oh my gosh, I'm going to do this thing and be an Olympian. I'm going to be an athlete for years to come until I actually already got there. Right, wow. That's the first time I've heard any athlete say that, like, oh yeah, well, I was already there. And then I thought, you know what, actually I could do this. So when, you, when you're when talking about and looking at athletes coming up and coming through who want to do what you've done, who want to get to the elite level, who want to go to the Olympics, for them, would you say, is, is sacrifice an inevitable aspect of getting to that level? Absolutely. I'm not going to sugarcoat it in any way. And sacrifice comes in different forms. For us, I feel like the sacrifice is always worth it. Because if you look at the nature of what we do, the day to day run ins, you know, people always want to be motivated saying, oh, I'm not having fun anymore. I'm doing this. I'm like, you don't have to be motivated every day because no one really is. But you do have to be disciplined in this game. You will not succeed in anything really without the discipline. So it becoming habitual was it made it a lot easier to go along and like do do the sport that we're in but I don't think that you can go along thinking that you're not going to be able to give up anything because you have to think about the kind of person and this is in life in general I think it it crosses many boundaries if you aspire to be this person x then you have to reflect in your values your goals in your actions in your day-to-day movements how you're eating sleeping moving that x person regardless what it is like they say like a sister act I said, if you wake up in the morning, girl, and all you can think about is singing, then you're a singer, girl. But if you're waking up telling me you want to be a singer and you ain't hit one little C note in about three years, I'm looking at you sideways like, really? Like, let me hear a C. You're like, "Eh, I don't want to, I don't want, you need to be hitting that properly because you're telling me you want to do something. Like, you really are saying to me, I want to be a singer. So I need you to emulate and invoke what a singer is. So I think it goes without saying to say you have to sacrifice because you got to face it, you might not be that person right now. And you probably won't ever be. It will always be something that you're going to grow into. You're going to personally develop yourself into being that person. So if you want to do track, for example, you say, I want to be the best athlete. You need to start learning your craft. You need to start researching what you need to do. You need to know yourself because who you are off the track is who you will be on the track. And if you're someone who is like delayed, lazy, needs a lot of diet, needs, gets a little bored easily, stuff like that, you're going to have to do things to train yourself mentally, physically, to get t- closer towards your goal so that it will become easy for you in the long run to actually get those goals. But you cannot rely on making it easy for yourself so that 
you're going to get your goal because you won't, you won't, you won't achieve it. You absolutely have to have an expectation of sacrifice, but also knowing where your, I call them deal breakers are. Everyone has them. Every athlete has them. And this is where I think it's really crucial when we don't, when coaches you know, shouldn't really want it more than the athlete, because at the end of the day, it's their journey. Now, if they don't want to give enough for it, then that's their journey. They're going to have to live with that. It's your you know, due diligence to get it out of them, but you cannot, you can only take them to water. You can't make them drink it. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's so spot on. Cause at the end of the day, who you are today is why you are where you are, what you've been doing up to this point is why you're where, where you are. But if you want to go somewhere else, you've got to do something different. And that usually means that something that's already in play needs to go and something that isn't in play needs to happen, which is sacrifice. So totally get it. Now, listen, we are both very young, fresh and tender, which means that we have seen a lot of things. <laughs> and one of the things that we both experienced was life in track and field, life in sport before um, UK lottery funding came into play and after. What do you think? Are there pros and cons to the whole lottery funding? I mean, a lot of countries don't even have funding, but but we we do. And, you know, I I've seen both the good and the bad. What about you? Like from your perspective, are there pros and cons to having funding like that in a country for sport? Yes, definitely. And I, I like that you phrased it with like saying pros and cons, because it's very easy to be really anti or really pro for it, you know. And yeah, we've been in an environment where we've experienced both. Like you can, that's why I never had you know, the idea of being a professional athlete, because there wasn't such a thing. I didn't even know that like, you could get paid. That's how naive I was starting out. I never thought, I'm like, you can get paid for this. Like I get paid running in a straight line fast like what what's going on here but there's other sports that get paid a whole heap of money which we would argue for doing a lot less so I was like actually I think pro in the sense that you're moving towards more professionalism as a sport in a, as a whole is always great because you're going to then get more people wanting to do it they're gonna you're not going to have certain careers that fit everyone like for example entrepreneurship right now is huge everyone is their own boss pretty much and that's the opportunity that you know the world the internet social media has brought to people which to me is great because we we, we like thinking outside the box we like innovative things we you know it's that kind of part of us being an athlete that's a little bit quirky a little bit different for why we could pursue something in sport in the first place but i also think that you're absolutely right in saying that is it is it positive negative yes because it becomes whirlwind and when we look at uk for example in terms of i would say the junior rankings to the senior rankings i think that's when it becomes a little bit a little bit trickier i think with the seniors if you've already kind of getting those accolades and you're already getting that there's not a huge difference however when you are very young for example you do one little quick thing and then you're getting all this attention it can produce a real a kind of laid back um mind mindset where number one they're just doing it for the money and we all know that it don't pay like that like you're looking at the small percentage the one percenters right. most people are not in the one percent they're all the five percent they're not there a lot of us can you can get by you can have quite a good career but most of the people even my list will not experience that what you're trying to aspire to so it, then it will boils back down to expectations if you expect that you're going to reach those high accolades those high echelons of it and you don't get there, it can be really detrimental to the, the person behind the athlete. And I think that's when it becomes tricky because you give up, they get so much so soon and then expectations rise up and then what they're doing doesn't match up and then there's a mismatch. And that's when I think it can be dangerous because then you're not doing it for the right reasons because the reason you're doing it for actually are not really realistic. And for you, whoever it might be, I would want to say what well, was realistic for someone, but they might be trying to achieve things because of those things that are in, in place that they might have not originally started off doing that. We all started it because we had fun and we enjoy it, but it's kind of like that's going to, it might it might run low, but generally you want to still have a passion for what you're doing because you're going to do a better job at it. Do you think there's a way to fund the sport in a balanced way that doesn't create that type of environment? Where the athlete I sort think, of gets complacent or there's that mismatch? I think the mismatch and that in terms of the funding, I actually don't think that the like the money is the root of all evil. I think what people do with it is the root of all evil. And I, I'm really strong on that because it's kind of like the mindset of, oh, you get more money, you get things. Well, actually, no, that actually amplifies the kind of person you are most of the time. And also the way you are treated externally by those people, for example, say you're getting suddenly your top then will have an impact on how you perceive yourself and also how you project yourself into the world. So you get almost changed or you might be 
kind of swayed by just the things that you're receiving. And so I don't think changing it, almost the funding structure in the way it is, because we're still at the very beginnings, I feel. I feel like there is so much in sport, in athletics, sorry, track and field, that could be done better. But I definitely think it needs more attention on the networking, how people structure the grassroots in terms of just the kind of team people have around them when they are at those breaking points, when they are getting those funding. Are the people around them looking after them? Do they have their best interests at heart? Are they setting them up for the end? Are they preparing them to be a better person away from their sport? These are the things I think would help bridge the gap between whether the funding is a pro or con, because I really think it's the way it's managed rather than it's like the amount they're getting or how often they're getting it. I think it's just the fact that people don't manage the, the individual very well and don't really have their welfare at best at heart. So they almost get dashed to the side when they're not doing well or then brought on and board when they are doing well, but there's no in between. And so you get a huge, huge disparity between you know, the haves and the haves not. Absolutely, absolutely. And like you said, there's those moments of being up, you know, and everyone's with you and then being down, it's like, who's that again? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure, I'm sure with your own career you had plenty of those moments but what would you say is the most memorable moment you had in track oh gosh my most memorable moment absolutely has to be my British record um and and it and it's that because of of definitely the build-up to it I always think the journey for me in my career has always been the defining moments in my career there have never been those one-off outlandish oh I just did that and I won that it wasn't and I'm sure that you absolutely can resonate with that because I remember like I, I remember seeing you are, are we the only one I think we were the only ones on the team that wore a leotard forgive me not like I think we had that the all in one I know one of my 100 meters and I was like touch is wearing hers doing the hurdles so I'm sure I can use it for just 52 like 51 steps do you know what I mean this one's doing a full lap and and I just think like when going to like being in the Olympic Games for me was was huge but the build up towards that and becoming the British record holder was even bigger and namely because I said to you about the sacrifices that I made beforehand I, I really prioritized my academics that year because it was really really important to me to have that there and I'd obviously been doing that my whole life um, and I made sacrifices to not go away in training um to, I'd got injured actually six weeks like the beginning of my first after my first race I got injured I had to go to hamstring tear six weeks out and that's really close to to the games and, and qualifying for the games but the feeling for me was because we had done all those things and Ayo, like I said, my, my coach was absolutely just like a godsend in trying to keep the faith and keep me going and keep me focused on the job at hand. And it was never too late. It was always like, it was never too late. And we were training before then. I remember we were doing it like some runs and training and him saying to me like, you, know, you can run 10 line off what you just did there and I was just like what I'm like really and we weren't trying to do it but the training was speaking for itself like I was really really in good shape I was flying well and everything was coming together but nothing matched really like crossing the line and and seeing the time and hearing I can hear him now say the commentator and he shouts out and that's a new British record and Ao sprinting across the track, like Ao ran 11.05 just coming to get see me, mate. Like he was gone. And he runs up to me and there's, I've even got a picture now, image, there's pictures of him having his arms wide, me having mine out. And he's shouting, we did it. He just said, we did it, Mon, we did it. And I, I that feeling I could never ever replace or, or kind of share and really describe what it feels like because it's, it, part of it is relief. And I know you know this because I saw your face. He's looking at the clock, and that's just like they're all watching. We're like, oh my gosh, what is it? And then she's like, yes. And I can see you do it now. I can see you go, yes, because you're just, you, you, it's an unbelievable feeling. Now, I haven't won a medal thing, but it, I can imagine it was the same feeling just of that, oh my gosh. And I remember I dropped to my knees. I dropped to my knees and I was like praying. I was like, thank you, God. I was on the floor, like literally down, saying, thank you, God. Like, wow we really really did that and everything was just a whirlwind after that and I, I had the best time in that in that sphere and really embraced who I was and had the just had fun and it was a great I think with the team obviously it was a great atmosphere but nothing for me would ever match those feelings just because the journey towards it was very like an unusual one right so I mean I I totally I can like you said I can relate to that feeling that moment when you got that but I wonder now 
you are now the British record holder. Expectations have just gone from like here to here to here to here. Like they're just through the roof now. What's the, is there like a new added pressure to maintain? Because, you know, they say it's easier to, to get an A than it is to keep one. Was it like that for you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Without a doubt. Um, looking back now, when I was reflecting on this yesterday, actually, um, speaking, I had, had a podcast doing an interview, and I, I, the same thing fluttered in my mind. I never really actually thought about this, whether I did have added pressure, because I don't really perceive external pressure. It's not in my nature. I'm, I am I don't really worry about that kind of stuff. I, I'm not even taken on by it at all, just because of the way I am. Like one of the guy, this guy, YouTube once said, I don't let anybody say anything about me or worry about any opinion of someone. They ain't going to pay my bills. Like if you, if you ain't paying my rent, I don't care what you got to say because if I'm homeless, you ain't gonna be there anyway. So who who cares? And I and I really get that. I really stand by that. I'm like, you can't care. Life's too short to worry about that. As long as you know, my mom's not gonna be just like embarrassed by me if I don't do well. I'm like, I'm not gonna have my family. It's still gonna be my family. But without realizing it, there was huge pressure because, like I said, and for me, I think it was a bigger shock because I never aspired to do that. I really didn't even go to the games to perform. I, I know that now. Looking back. We didn't have a real goal of where I need to be. We we're just trying to get as so far as we could get. And I would never do that now. I would be like, right, we're going to have a goal. We're going to actually have something tangible we're going to work towards. But it was always bonus round. It was like, oh, my gosh, I finished. Oh, my gosh, British record holder. Oh, my gosh, I'm making the games. They're bonuses. They were all bonuses for me. They were lifelong dreams. So it, it, for it to all come at one time, I wasn't really ready for it because I never asked for it. I was just trying my best. It just so happened that my best became the best that anyone's ever done. And then suddenly I'm like, oh, so so what now? And I'm a full time athlete. Remember, I'm not I'm not um, working anymore. I've got Nike sponsorship. I'm an Olympian. I'm Britain's fastest ever female athlete, like 100 meter runner. That you're 22 years old. Like now we know in our good old ripe 25 year old age, we know <laughs> that when you're 22, you don't know nothing. Sorry, 22 year olds, but you don't. You don't know nothing, and no, you think really. you do. You, you say eight, hey, and you think you're grown. And unfortunately, you know, you're not. There's so much more growing for you to do as a person, for you to learn about the world. And I was not really ready for that. And I went into, uh, you know, I went into the, my, my winter training, like five kilos too heavy. And then suddenly I'm, do, I'm doing this and I've got all this immediate attention. And I, I think it did really have an effect on the expectations, not just I had for myself, but now I know that everyone expected of me. Because I know that every time I run, they're just like, did you win? Like people that don't know stuff. Like family that I never seen before, but all oh, did you win? And I'm like, you can't win everything. It, does, it never worked like that. I, where you been? I've been there like six, seven years grinding, and now all of a sudden you asking me every two seconds whether I've won. It, yeah. it does have a part. It, it will get to you mentally. And if you don't, if you're not strong enough, or you don't have anyone that's around you that can really point that out to you and keep you focused and grounded, it can sniff up behind you. And I, I think for me, it really did have those those effects. And I didn't. And I, unfortunately, I never even realized. Right. When you say that, how do you know now, looking back, that it did have, have those effects? Was there a certain way that you saw stuff or was your mindset changing? How did it affect you? I think I know now because when I look back, I think I did. I still didn't really appreciate who I was at all. Like I am probably I've got like huge imposter syndrome, by the way. Like you don't know what that is. Like I I'm the kind of person that would be like, and this person, we have this great person, she's an Olympian, she's a former British record holder, she's gonna be the first summer win Olympic and they, and they'll call you, my you name and I'll be like, like oh. I'm, I'm like that. I'm like, oh, who's this person? She's coming out, I wanna see her too. And then they look the spotlights on me, and I'm like, oh sugar, they're talking about me. That's me. I have to go up there and do that now. Like that is honestly the realness of it is, and it's something that I work on now to this day because you you have to own the spaces that you're in. And as well as I know that I work my butt off to get these things and be in positions that I'm in, it still bewilders me that I I'm very I'm a very simple. That's why I keep saying to some people I'm. I look at them and I'm going, look, I'm just a South London black girl. Like, honestly, that's how I perceived myself. And now I have to really change that mindset. And the reason why I could, I noticed why it had an effect is because I didn't set my standards, although I had been the whole of my life and setting them high and doing my best. I didn't now go, you now are going to be, you, you're aiming for world finals. You're aiming for those those medals. You're, you're going to make the next step up. What are you going to be? How are you going to be different now in what you're doing now 
to be better in what you're doing. It took a few years for me to realize that. It actually probably took me, I remember maybe 2010, 11. And actually it wasn't until I tell you a moment is when I realized that it was getting to me and that I was so low. And it actually was when Mo Green, Maurice Green, because he came my coach in 2011, 12 season. I was at Daegu and Mor someone, one of the twins, I think it was Mick, I don't know who was there, Mickey or Mel was there and came up to me and said to me, I think it was Mickey and said, someone, someone's got their eye on you. And I was just like, hey, what were the, but she didn't mean it like that. And um, I was like, oh, okay, cool. And she was just like, oh, someone's eye because he wanted to coach me essentially. And when I spoke to him, he had said to me, look, you basically just said, you know, you are fantastic. You are not getting the respect you deserve you've got so much potential and I want to help you guide that. And he was, the only, honestly, that conversation, my mind, it blew my mind. Because again, I was looking around like, he wants to talk to, he wants to talk to who? But for someone to see the potential in me, I'd realised that since 2008, up in 2011, I had not given myself the credit that I deserved and I had not really matched up to what I, I could possibly do because my actions weren't showing that. And that really became a turning point when I realised late that, that's why you didn't realise, because when he said that to you, that was a shock. And really, truly, it shouldn't have been. Just for those who don't know track and field, Maurice Green yep. is one of the, I mean, he's one of the people who ran the most under 10 second times in, in history. So for someone of that calibre to come and say that is, you know, where you can put that in perspective when you really know who that is. This wasn't just some guy from the gas station who <laughs> He said, hey, you're looking good. <laughs> <laughs> now, you had a fantastic it. career, Monty. And, of course, like, being a British record holder is a huge part of that. But eventually that all comes to an end. You you did eventually retire. Did you know when it was time? Were you ready? Were you prepared? How did your retirement process go? I haven't even retired. <laughs> I never... Do you know what? Like, I never... I've never... Outland outwardly said of it, I'm retired. And it's probably part of the thing that I thought, like, I, I do I need to say it? Do people care? I'm like, don't mean anything. But mainly because I was always a trier. So like I am I actually, although I'm have that weird and pistol syndrome thing where I'm like, oh, I'm not sure if I can do that. I believe I can do anything. Like honestly, I really do. I don't know if you feel like this. I'm sure you do. Like I feel like a superwoman. Like there's nothing that I would say that I can't do. It's not in my vocabulary. I would never go like, oh, I can't do that. I would always try. I would always go, well, I'm going to try and get it done and see what happens. So for me, I never, I never was just like, I'm going to stop. I'm going to be ready. I'm going to do whatever. And I actually, did, I think I delayed my process because I went into bobsleigh. And I think that really helped because it gave me a new focus. I mean, I was 29 when I went to bobsleigh. So some of you going like, my four years 25, but five and five plus four is 25. Hey, don't worry anyway. about the math, man. Don't worry about the math. <laughs> yeah, like, don't worry about it, sweetheart. Don't worry about <laughs> it. Just, just know we're 21 still. That's all you need to know. <laughs> so the transition into bobstay actually really helped me have a refocus and a new challenge. And so at such a late time in my life, it just had a new spark. So I didn't really kind of, I was still kind of focused on that. I still wanted to do it. And I had an, uh, an amazing, um, 2017, when I was with Michael Afalaka, which is a British coach, British Olympic coach. I joined Michael and I was with him for about two years. And in my third year, I was in absolute insane shape. I just come back actually from my first Bob Slay season. I had about eight weeks, 10 weeks out there. We did really well first season and I was in great shape. So I came back in and did an opener and I actually opened with my fastest ever opener in 100 metres. Now, I was ready to go. Like, I was really ready to go. I'm like, we're going to do this. My coach is like, cool, we're going to do it. And training, I was flying, like, every session for about two weeks was PBs on anything. You give me a 30, I'm doing a PB. You give me that, I'm giving it a 30. Insane. And unfortunately, this is when I learned about doing two sports, that I, I ruptured my hamstring, completely tore it off the bone, 4C, like, done it. It was not attached. I remember sitting there, lying in there, screaming my head off, grabbing my thigh, and saying, I don't think, I looked at my SNC coach, everyone was there, they ran yeah. over. And I looked and I said, I don't think this is attached. And she just was like, oh my gosh. And she nearly threw up and walked away. Cause I was like, I, it sounded like someone shot me. I heard it outside my body. And it felt like someone had just go, a dog it into my hamstring. Like it really felt like someone tumped me up. So mm -hmm. I was just like, what on earth has just happened? And I screamed out and my coach actually said to me, what happened? And I was just like, it's gone. And he said to me, I thought you screamed because you ran so fast. 
And he showed me the clock and he went, he's trying to PB. And that's where I was. So this is 2017. So this is what, four years ago now, it was May, 18, 19, 20, 21. Uh, really, and I was still doing track and I ran fast, but then I had this injury and I said, okay, I'm done. I can't do this to myself anymore. I can't balance the two. And I also can't do this whole, I had to have surgery. I had to work my way back and go back into, to, I focus on Bobsay and I have been focused now on Bobsay for the last three years. So my retirement was so delayed in, in, in athletics. I never thought I needed to announce or say, oh, I'm definitely done now because I did a new sport and it kind of glossed over it. And I looked back at it even now. I'm like, actually, if I get in great shape next year, I might just do a little indoors. Uh, I'm going to be V35, <laughs> but I'm still, I might do it. But and mainly because I love track. I don't think I'd ever, I don't know if I'm ever going to retire from it. I think it'd be something that I love to do. And I always think that because how, how good, I don't know if you feel like this, and I'm sure you probably do, that I'm not allowed to do track for fun anymore. <laughs> like, if I ever said to someone, oh, I might go and do a race next year for they'll be like, what? Like, you're still doing, why are you still doing athletics? And I'm like, I'm not doing it to be there. Like, I love, I actually love training and doing it and being fast and stuff, see if I can push my body. And if my body's healthy enough to do it, which it is, it's super strong, you know, I'm PB and even now, to, then I'm going to do it. So I never, I don't know if I'll ever retire. I mean, you might have me on here in about 20 years' time <laughs> talking about like, Oh, so you just broke the record for, uh, <laughs> for the under 60, uh, 60 meters when you run about 8.3 seconds. How you feeling? That's what we might be doing. I, you heard it here first, you folks. That might you be it right. <laughs> No, I'm listen, first of all, I know that pain with the hamstring. 2009, that same thing happened to me. They said one more fiber and that thing would have been off the bone. That pain is unbelievable. Crawling to breakfast is the situation. But yeah, I know what you're saying with competing into your dear old age. Just like, even now though, I've got to be honest, sometimes when I'm running, I feel like, um, for me, I feel like on the outside, it looks like I have a Zimmer frame. Like, I feel like I'm moving, like, yeah, got this. And then from the outside, they're like, this old, 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 old lady needs to sit down. <laughs> the body just feels different, man. Oh, but, yeah. <laughs> You know, four years now, you're, you've, you're, you're kind of really getting into your career in bobsled. How, how the heck did you just spring up from summer sports to winter sports? And, and what, what's the goal now? Because I know you recently went to a major championship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I got basically scouted, I guess. I, I, I was invited to come down um, and try out for bobsled because uh, one of the coaches was actually from the British athletics team for a very long time, Michael Kamel. He was one of the coaches within the mix. I knew him for years. He knew me and he said to me, come down. And he actually tried for about two years before I actually went. Every year he was going to me, come, come just, you'd be great coming down. They really wanted bigger, faster girls um, because weight is really important in, in Bob's day. So to be a bit heavier helps. And because my natural frame and my height, I'm naturally heavier than the other girls. I'm naturally fast anyway. So they were just like perfect combination. And I went to try out and actually broke the evaluation testing record, the GB record that they get you to do basically to see how, how you are. And I scored obviously the, the best. So when I went from, from going on then to going on ice, it, it was an easy, I say an easy transition. It was a, a nice transition. It was very, very steep learning curve for me. But like I had six runs down the track before my first World Cup race. Now World Cup race in Bob's Day is basically like a diamond league. Like you, you're in the deep end, it's GB, you, you're straight in. It's the highest thing you can do before you do world championships. So I kind of went into that, but I was kind of tricked because the testing is like at my local track, you have to run a couple 60s, you have to use this trolley, which is called a roll bob, that you push, that measure your time. You have to do some jumps into the pit. And then they go, yeah, great, you're great for bobstay. And then you get flinged down an ice mountain at about 140 <laughs> kilometers an hour and your body's folded in half. Like you've got five to six Gs going through your spine. You know what that, you know what that feels like? Oh my God, honestly, I said the Lord's Prayer the whole way down for my first run because I was, people, I was like, this is it, this is it, I'm not gonna make it. Like, oh, it's yeah. hard, it's very tough. Um, but I'm a bit of, I'm a speed freak. I'm a adrenaline junkie. I love fast stuff like Formula One, cars, anything, anything that's fast, I, I do enjoy, I love that stuff. So I just loved that it was a new sport, never done it, new environment. Like, I was seeing mountains with ice and snow on it. Like, you know, in Catford, there's no mountains, right? <laughs> Like, I, I was like, what, where am I? Is that a mirage? What is that there? They're like, that's the Alps. The who, the where, the Alps. I don't know, I don't know what it is. And we do a summer sport. So we go to hot countries and we're wearing the crop top and knickers. I'm not in a full snowsuit with 
cat and snood. Like, we don't wear this stuff, but it was such a different environment. And I love that it was an experience. So for me to just keep progressing and pushing and now when I look forward to it, I just kept on resetting goals. And last Olympics, I went as a reserve because I'd snapped my hamstring. So that was the six months before the Winter Olympics is when I snapped my hamstring. So I had to do that whole journey back, crawl my way to make the team. And I made the team was reserve and got in insane shape. But now my goal was like, right, I want to make the Olympics because making the, the next Winter Games means that I become Britain's first summer Winter Olympian female. There's so many men, the men are doing it. But sisters need to be doing it for themselves. So I'm 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 trying to lead from the front here. So that's that's my goal. That's why I'm still here. That's fantastic. That is absolutely fantastic. Hold on, where am I? Get in there. Get in there, Tasha. Tasha, where are you? <laughs> oh, there you are. <laughs> so I want to ask you then, when you look at the things that you learned from track and field, the things that you did do, the things that you didn't do as a track athlete. What are those things that have now made you better? Like, okay, I didn't do this. I need to do this when I'm a Bob said athlete, or I did do this. I need to even like bring it even bigger. Are there any things like that, that from that long journey as a track athlete that you've now taken into Bob said, like, okay, I got this. Yeah. Oh, good one. So yes, because it's been so new and I've had to re not reinvent, but kind of remix myself. You know, you just sprinkle a little bit of something extra each time. That's what I've kind of taken on board and doing. But one of the greatest things, I guess, being, being a senior athlete, you've been in the game, I've been doing it for 20 years and I kind of know why my body is. And your body changes hugely. Like you, when you put in that much work, that you don't need the same amount of work. You don't need the same amount of process that you've done before. And as long as you're learning as a person, as an athlete, you can make the better decisions for yourself. So one thing I definitely have taken into bobsleigh is definitely the mindset because paramount, you know, physically I'm there. I don't need anything more, but I do have to be smarter in the way that I apply myself because in track, one of the things that confidence is a huge thing. Okay, self-efficacy within any specific environment is a huge thing. And it can count for a lot. You can beat someone in a 100 meter race, a 400 meter hurdle race in shot put, just from men be mentally better than them before you even get inside the core room. Because right. that is a big thing. And we, and we all know that we've experienced before, whether we've been on either end of it, that you can win it before you even step out there and hear your name on the start line. So I've taken that into Bob's say because sometimes it's not going to be smooth. It's not going to be the way that you you need it to be. Things aren't going to go to plan. Even this year alone, building up, I had three weeks before our national trials because we had lockdown for how many months? So it was nothing. And I had a really bad foot problem, bursitis, and it literally was a pain. I couldn't even walk for three months. I, contact, agony. And so when I went back into stuff, my body was just so, had no impact, had no impact going through one side of it for so long yeah. that I had to build that back up. But because I've got injured so so soon and I had to crawl my way back up and get pulled back, I only had literally three weeks before trials. Now, I remember my physio saying to me, well, you need, you can't go flat out. And I was just like, you know, it's trials. And he's just like, you're going to have to go 80%. So in my mind, I had to be confident enough that I could win on 80% of me. I have to tell myself, your 80% is enough. You don't need anything else. Like, you need to remember who you are. And that my mindset of knowing that when I come to the table, I'm going to make sure that I give 100%. I might only have 80%. Shoot, I might only have 23%. But you ain't going to know that because I'm going to give 100 of it and you're going to have to still beat me on that day. And that's definitely something that I've taken into into being into bobsleigh. It's just the mindset of you being able to bring things out necessary when you need them so that they're ready for you to perform likewise in things that I didn't really do it's definitely not, not taking it for granted learning your craft I don't think I think athletes now are in a much better position than we were back then I really do yeah. the thing has changed is so different like I don't I haven't coached anyone to anything yet I haven't started my process fully in coaching I love to coach but I really like consult and help an assistant coach with co people and from what I I didn't know anything when I was winging it I didn't know anything some of these athletes are getting the real, they're getting the good stuff, the good quality yeah. gold stuff. And they're just far ahead, much far ahead than us. So I would, I never underestimate learning your craft and learning how to do it rather than like what you want to get. Oh, I want to run this. Okay, we're going to forget what you want to run. I'm going to tell you how to get there because that is how you're going to be able to replicate it. That is how you're going to know exactly what to do. And that is how you're going to achieve what you want to achieve. And I definitely bring that into my Bob's Day because I still push 
how to be a better break woman, which is why I'm, I'm the pusher. I really, really am big on learning that craft so that I can be, you know, one of the best break women in the world. That's fantastic. Because at the end of the day, what that, you know, solidifies is that you grow. And, you know, that lesson for everyone else is that you should be growing. If you, you know, even if your times aren't getting faster, if you have learned something, if you've learned more than you knew a year ago, eventually that will change. That will figure itself out. But if you're not growing with your mindset and you're not taking the negative or positive experiences and using them for your future experiences, then, you know, what are we doing? (laughs) What exactly are we doing? Now, what about it? In terms of professional, like being a professional athlete, Mm -hmm. how lucrative is the bobsled? I mean, you were a track athlete. There's funding there. What's it like on the bobsled side of life in terms of finance, support, sponsor? Well, it's like this. (laughs) Wait, see, do you see? Do you see this? This is what it's like. (laughs) I've basically funded my olympic dream myself pretty much i mean yeah it, it, it's 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 not there it's not there this the, the sport that i'm in you know god bless its soul it, it it's a very it's, it's an it's a world-class sport that doesn't run world in a world-class manner really you know mm. it's, a, it's a service sport. it came from the services the army the navy that those kind of things where they where it's the background is and it's kind of like it's it had that weird culture, especially in this country, not generally other races, because you look at the Germans, when you look at even the Americans, came, it's a different ball game there because it's pro- it's professional, it's different. Uh, people do struggle still, but like an athlete, I mean, to be honest, th- there's not, there's no funding, I mean, there's no funding for us now at all. Um, we're blessed that we as a team have got sponsors that look after us and our like actual sponsors that sponsor our season and stuff but you know i've you know the last three years you know i work 40 hour working week i'm training 20 plus hours a week like i'm really putting it in and i'm, I'm tired to be frankly i'm really tired yeah. um because it's hard that's hard work and to be honest that's not what any athlete has to do especially at my age because we recover slower it's, it's very difficult to recover from that kind of workload which means you do have to reduce training which means you do have to look at more quality than quantity there's ways around it but it's not ideal and we're trying to inc- i think that's the, my dream has become bigger than my circumstance right now so I am trying to find a way like I always have done. Like when I was, you know, like I said, for six years and lead up to the Olympic Games in 08, I was working. I was working part time and I was studying as a student from age, like 19 to 21 to finish at the Beijing Games, literally what a, a day before I um, quite, broke the British record. The day after I broke the British record is the day that I graduated. I went to my university and to get my graduation thing the hat. And I, all that work ethic, all that pushing and striving, it's the same thing. It's that that's been the same thing into Bob. So, so I've I've made my dream more important than what it is that I'm kind of what I'm receiving from the sport. But it, it isn't there yet, and hopefully one day it will be there. But I think what we do will have a direct influence on that. The kind of thing if we lead the way and we perform really well, then obviously the sport does better because the funders and and, and the government bodies look at it and go, oh wow, push more into it because it's doing well. But it's a very unique sport. You know, you can uh, you have to be at least seventeen to do it, so you can't do it at a younger age. Not many people see it because it's not a big sport. Uh, they don't really want to do it. It's a bit weird. You have to be away for long periods of time. So it's a way of finding it more to be more attractive, I think, in any sport. It's trying to get to kind of get the numbers in. Um, but I love it. And I really do look at it. It's kind of like, well, do you want to do it or not? And if you do, then you find a way and, and don't have any excuses. Because essentially, my my goals, uh, I'm not going to be hindered by what, you know, what I've not been able to get from my circumstances right now. That is, that is brilliant because at the end of the day, you know, that attitude of pushing forward in spite of your circumstances is exactly what has made many, 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 many people, Oprah, Richard Branson, I love to say them names, because they, in spite of their circumstances, he had dyslexia, she came from poverty, they were able to become the people that they are. So that is exactly the attitude that makes it happen. Now, in addition to like lottery funding, which wasn't around. We've been on both sides. Also, social media wasn't around in oh, the way gosh, that it is right. today, right? And it it 
it's it's a fantastic tool, but it can, it, you know, it can be your best friend or your worst nightmare. How important, you know, especially in a sport where funding isn't, you know, at the highest heights, how important is social media to your career now? I think, oh, hugely. And not because I think it is, but that's the way the world is right now, apparently. Like, really is. I've had to, I've had to really push myself in terms of, like, being more social media aware and, and being out there and posting all the time. So much though that I, I've been a bit ergo, like I've been a bit ghost for the last two weeks. People keep messaging <laughs> me like, are you all right? What are you going to be? What see? My brother's like, well, you know, it's, yeah, literally, my brother was like, you know, it's something's going on when my son's got a story up. Like, it's literally just got the little plus sign on it because I ain't posted nothing for ages. But the fact that people miss it is because I was really trying to push it because I was aware that, you know, I want sponsors right now. I don't have anyone sponsoring me for anything. I've got some couple of, um, product sponsors and like protein and things like that and my BCAs but in terms of like getting finance for stuff and not being able to have to work 40 hours a week do you know what I mean but I don't have any external sponsors but I know that if I put my brand out there my profile my story out there I feel that that's that's why it's going to be it, it that can change but like you said we never had that stuff and I but I do think it's really important because everyone's on it and it doesn't really matter that you're not that kind of person that you don't believe in social media. I'm like, well, social media believes in you. So you're going to have to get to it because that's what the companies, that's what the industries they're looking for. They're looking for a way that they can plug that. And it has actually opened a lot of doors for people to be closer to you and get to know you a bit better. But I, I do think, for example, if it was when we were around, can you imagine? I mean, I just got my Facebook account, I think in 2007, like the year before. <laughs> so I remember my friend telling me about Facebook and I was like, what is this book of Facebook? forced me into Facebook? Yeah, see? <laughs> then all you, you, you just, me off. <laughs> and suddenly just become addicted. We didn't have that. We just got it. And it's kind of like, imagine if it was then. But, you know, our lives would look very different now if we had it 10 years ago. Absolutely, without a doubt. Come on now, it wouldn't be. Because yeah. where, who we are as athletes then, the athletes that would be now, you'd have millions of followers. You'd be, you'd be, it'd be, it'd be completely different. And it's kind of like that's opportunity that social media gives to people. But it also can be quite challenging, I think, for them because you will get trolls. You will get people that will say negative things. You have people do have access to you a lot better more than what they would have had there before because I never really had people saying negative stuff or the media really because I, you just don't get that. Whereas here, they're a lot more. It's a lot more access for you. But I think if we try and use it positively, like you said, for my sport, I just put it out there because people don't really see. I mean, you ain't gonna see no other person that looks like me sliding around on ice, especially in this country. It's not gonna happen. So I am being the voice for that to show you that you know things might tweak a little bit, but you can still achieve something if you keep your mind open. And, and be open to the new opportunities. Fantastic. So you've been at the elite level in two sports, right? That's There's not a lot of people that can say that. Um, for up and comings, people who want to be the best at what they do, if you could say, you know, in a nutshell, what does it take to be great at pretty much everything you attend? Everything, yeah. So absolutely number one, if you want to be, like you said, be good at anything or be the best at, or be not the best, it's your, your best, best. Yes. at any attempt. Because we don't ha really have, uh, th there's not this quantifiable thing of like, that's the best. I mean, you could in chat be like, well, you got to run 10 nine. Like, I'll never know. There's very something very tangible that you can try and uh, try and get to. But you're not going to know whether you can get it unless you do it, right? So I would say categorically, definitely number one, you have to, like I said, be willing and being prepared to put yourself in uncomfortable positions that like you cannot be comfortable with being who you are. Because if you're aspiring to be the best at something, like you said before, it means something needs to change. It likely means that the way you're looking at something has to be looked differently. The way you're approaching something has to work differently. You have to move like this. Those things are not comfortable. It's not gonna be nice. It's not gonna be pretty. It's not gonna be easy. But you categorically, if you wanna be the best, you look at what the best is in your field, whether it's a designer, whether it's YouTube, whether you are on social media, whether you're an influencer, whatever it is. If you're in a realm where you're a coach, you look at, I would say, you, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. You, you look at the best and say, do I reflect exactly what it is that I'm trying to be? in various different parameters. There are different ways you can say that. And athletes are really easy because we're athletes to look by. So I can look at an athlete. And I tell this to the guys that I assistant coach, saying, you guys are coming and saying you want to run X, Y, Z. Now look at those people that you know that do run these times 
And would you say that you reflect the kind of person when you look in the mirror, are you seeing that person that is worthy or someone that is reflective of what you would expect of someone that's going to run that? And there's your answer. Because mm-hmm. it takes on everything then. I don't have to go into like, you need to be confident, you need to believe in yourself. Well, all those things are absolutely true. You do need to be confident. You do have to believe that you can actually do it. But actually beyond even believing you can do it, if you keep eventually keep pushing and trying anyway, even if you didn't think you could do it, you 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 could still get there just because of your persistence. Persistence would outrun the fact that you believe that you could do it because you go, I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to quit until I get it. And it's not believe that you think that you can do it. You know, I'm just going to not going to give up. I'm just going to keep getting up because, like you said, people don't lose a boxing mat. Usually, they use because they don't get back up. Like you can't beat someone that just keeps getting back up. So you have to be willing and prepared to keep back getting back up. You have to be reflective in who you are as a person now and where you want to get to and absolutely ensure that when you are attacking these things and to be the best, that you are giving everything that you can give to it, the right things, and you do that by researching what you need and researching all the things you need at any one time and make sure you're putting 100% of whatever you have at that moment into it. You cannot really leave rooms for excuses, but being reflective in what you're doing also allows you to understand and, and understand that if you have good reasons not to be too hard on yourself, because a part of the process is as well, it's being understanding and realistic about what it is that you're doing. Do I think I'm doing something or am I actually doing it? Because they're two different things. I need you to know what you're doing. I don't want you to keep telling me what you think you are. Because if you keep telling me, oh, my arm's straight, and you've got an athlete that's running like this all the time, <laughs> my arm's straight. I'd be like, I don't care if you think your arm's straight. Your arm's not straight. And then suddenly they're like, they think they're running like this, but they're really running straight. That's what I want. Now, I don't care whether you feel it's not straight anymore, but you're doing it right now. So it doesn't become about what you think you're doing. It becomes about what you're actually going out and doing every day. And that's the only way those small marginal gains, looking at the small things, breaking them down, is the way that you're going to get to be the best or your best, more importantly, in your field. Absolutely. You heard it, people. She told you. (laughs) So final question, Monty, Dougie Doug. If you fulfill your life's mission, what will you have accomplished? Oh gosh, what would I have accomplished? <gasps> That's a really scary question. Um, I really struggle with this because I want so much. <laughs> well, I know I one thing really... is you want to be an example to people who look like you, you know. Who, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Especially in bobsled who aren't, you know, you know, like you said, there's not a lot of representation as far as young black girls doing uh, what you do. So I know that that would be something that would be great, but... What else yeah, is that up your sleeve? You know, I say my life goal, like, I definitely, like, my one, like I said, goal now is, like, the next 12 months is really important to me, kind of setting stuff up, because it's something that I feel that I would be like, okay, great, you've been able to master this. But I also think, what would I have achieved? I actually really, I know it might sound cliche, but when I think about it, if I look back, like you said, what would you have achieved? I would actually have achieved things that I can't even imagine right now. Right. And the reason why I say that is because for so long, from when I was young, and I never imagined being a professional athlete, yeah. and I never imagined being a British rock or an Olympian, those were things actually beyond my wildest dreams. So I cannot even limit myself to what I could achieve and be happy yeah. with, because frankly, I actually don't know, because I never knew. But right. I just keep aspiring to grow within business, to grow within, like you said, mentoring young women, to grow within being a summer winter Olympian. I just keep moving the goalpost. Every time I achieve something, I move the goalpost. So when I look back on my life goal, I won't even know retrospectively what it was that I could have achieved. <laughs> I can't tell you now, but I'll tell you when I get there. Because now I'm going to it. tell you, oh, apparently it was that. Because like then, beforehand, apparently I could have done those things that I never imagined possible. TBD, people. You heard it here first. <laughs> Don't sleep on this spot. So, Monty, there's people yeah. out there. They want to follow you. They want to sponsor you. They want to see what you're up to. They want to support you in your career and whatever, you know, the, the question mark things that you're going to achieve in the future. Mm-hmm. How do they get, like, how do they find out where you are and what you're doing? Oh, I really need to get a website because people keep asking me this stuff. I've been trying to get a website <laughs> about 10 years. I don't <laughs> like, hardly anyone has a website anymore, but they've got Instagram. I know. 
<laughs> I do. And they literally it's Instagram. And actually, all my handles are the same from when they were since the Book of Faces. Like, Monty Trackstar is my handle, even though I'm a bobstayer now. So, yeah, Monty Trackstar at Instagram. Um, and then my full name at gmail.com if people want to email me. I'm always, I'm very open and I kind of, like, manage what I'm doing. And, and, and I'm always out there to talk to people and if they want to make a contact. So, please, please do. I'm very um, open and friendly person. Um, I'll be here for you. So, yeah. Fantastic. Well, as per usual, hanging out with you, girl, has always been a uh, joy. And I'm still with no withdrawals because, you know, we used to make a lot of crazy YouTube videos well, together. I'm st still suffering from Imagine the not TikToks right now, though, that we would be blowing up. Do you know we'd be TikTok famous in about three days? Come on now. We, we would. There's still <laughs> time. It would be there is. There is. That is the motto of, of my whole everything. There is still time. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And I'm sure we'll be seeing more of you in the future, Monty. I really appreciate you taking yeah, the time for that nice late me. where you are. So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> good luck. Thank you very much. Bye, Bye guys. Listen, I probably should have like cut that interview off like half an hour ago, guys. But I just think she's such a star. She's so amazing. She has such great things to say, such great perspective from uh, the way that she approached her sports, uh, plural, and the way that she's determined. Even now, you know, at an age where people would have already packed it up, listen, I put so much effort into one sport already. I'm not starting brand new. She is very determined. And I think it's important for people to see that attitude, that gusto, that drive, and what it takes to, to create that. So I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Don't forget to like, share and follow. Remember, there is a bigger movement happening behind all these interviews, which you can find out more about on www.globalsportschannel.com and www.www.www. Eliminate most of those W's and just leave three. .loveathletes.com. Find out more. Find out how you can support the careers, lives and retirements of track, football, rugby, any sport you can think of, we are here to support. So you can too. Check it out. That's all from me.